Hi. Having completed the story of David uh, in the Philistine territory in 1 Samuel 27 and 29, and then the story of David in chapter 30 when the Amalekites attacked his town of Ziglag and took the women and all their property and David got them back, we now return to the simultaneous story in chapter 28 where Saul, desperate to know what to do in the face of the Philistines, uh, consults a woman uh, who can summon the dead and get Samuel to tell him, leave me alone. So as we're looking at the larger chiasm that takes up the second half of 1 Samuel, we're returning uh, here to the, um, to the green section here. We've been all the way down through these blue sections. We're returning to this green section of Saul calling up the spirit of Samuel here, parallel um, to uh, David with Samuel at here, where Saul was among the prophets with Samuel. And the question of prophecy and this woman will be at issue. In other words, who can be an authorized voice of Yahweh to help people out? And notice that both sections are paralleled by Saul asking Mishal, his daughter, why have you deceived me in related to, relation to David? And the woman asking Saul here, why have you deceived me uh, in relation to who he is? So that's the larger picture. And we've also been looking at how our current chapter 28 is part of a pair of these sandwiches, narrative sandwiches. So here, this one is between the two David and Asia stories. And we'll see today, as you can see on the left side of the screen, these first two verses, there's a little transition that continues the David and Asia story before it repeats the fact that Samuel had died from earlier in 1 Samuel and then gets to our immediate story here, setting us for, up for this parallel context. This three-chapter uh, sandwich is parallel to the earlier one that we looked at in chapters 24 to 26. And as we saw there, David with Abigail, where she gave David good news about his future. Here's Saul and the woman of Ender, where she gives Saul bad news about his future. And there are other elements in which these stories fit together, because Nabal here, Abigail's uh, husband, who is always referred to as that way, even when David takes her as his wife, she's always referred to as the woman of Nabal. Uh, his name literally means fool, Nabal meaning fool. But Asia, whose name doesn't mean that, plainly is playing the fool. Um, in both chapters, uh, assuming David is like a good angel and trusting that he's completely on his side and it takes his generals to wake him up, even though he barely does wake up, to the fact that David is an Israelite and the Israelites are the ones who killed Goliath and the rest we know. So a pair of, of important fools, a rich land-owning fool Nabal and an enemy king uh, Ashish, raising the question about Saul the fool as well. And he will certainly look much the fool in this chapter as we'll see. Um, there's an interesting aspect of the location sequence that shows the, the simultaneity of these two stories. So as we are looking in chapters 27 and 29, we saw that it began in, in Gath, um, the home of Asich and the home of Goliath as well. The Philistines in chapter 29 went to Aphek and Israel to Jezreel. Then the Philistines go up to Jezreel and that continues uh, over here and will lead to the Battle of Mount Gilboa. Meanwhile, David and his men went down to Ziglag on the third day, found it burned down. And we saw that last time in this region down here. Uh, even though scholars don't know for sure where Endor is, it's certainly likely to be located up here in this region. And we'll look at some more details of that. So what we noted is while David's down here trying to recover his women and the property and get, keep his men all together in the face of an almost rebellion against those who were too exhausted across the river and whether they get a share of the spoils, Saul is up here ready to take on the Philistines. Highlighting one narrative angle that David is nowhere near the place that Saul died. But as we'll see in 1 Samuel 31, and also when we continue in 2 Samuel 1, it's ambiguous altogether whether David was in, involved in it even though he wasn't there. One doesn't have to be there in order to be involved in the death of somebody. So we'll look more at that later. But this location sequence is certainly setting up the initial idea that David was innocent of Saul's death. He was nowhere near. So as we also look at key words here, uh, we see that the woman is a key word throughout. If I make this smaller so you can see the whole chapter there, you see how she's the focus throughout. Uh, I translated it here ghost uh, women um, instead of medium. We'll look a little later at the various terms that scholars use to try to refer to her, none of which is right in the sense because there's not a right English word. And there's some cross-cultural issues uh, and assumptions about modern interpreters about what was going on in this story that have been challenged by more recent theories. So we'll be looking at all that not just today but as we go and then we'll see in the second half of the chapter the question of hands and we see that so many times here and finally as she confronts him with great boldness with the question of who you're listening to and we know that throughout Saul has had a problem listening Yahweh's not listening to him he's not listening to Yahweh and in this chapter Samuel will not listen to Saul either
So let's leave the keywords up there a little larger as, as I've been doing with the keywords. I also try to translate sometimes words more consistently. I just noticed I didn't do that here in one that we'll look at, but we'll see that in just a second. So I left up the last verse of chapter 27 so we can see where we were in the narrative sequence here. This is King Ashash here being assured in his own mind, this is him talking to himself, that David has made himself utterly abhorrent to his people Israel, therefore he shall be my eternal servant. Um, and uh, the, the narrator notes here at the beginning of chapter 8 that some time has passed. This little phrase, in those days, is only used a few times uh, elsewhere in 1 Samuel. One that's key is 4.1. Let's look at that there. But before we do, let's look at the context here. What's being said is in those days, sometime in the narrator's past, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. But back here in 4.1, we saw this. And the word of Samuel came to Israel. In those days, the Philistines mustered for war against Israel. And Israel went out to battle against them. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines camped at Aphek which we see in chapter 29 right here, where the Philistines gathered their forces at Aphek, where the Israelites in Jezreel. So there's certainly an echo there of that, and this is bringing up the fact that Saul uh, has been fighting with the Philistines, or Israel's been fighting with the Philistines throughout this entire book. So after that narrator's introduction, uh, and the Philistines gathered their forces for war, uh, Machane, twice in the verse here, usually as camp, but as forces here, to fight against Israel, Ashish said to David, you know, of course, that you and your men are to go out with me in the army, stating something that we already know, so that's not adding anything to the story exactly, but this does. David said to Ashish, very well, or uh, in Hebrew, can thus, uh, as the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon notes, it's an idiom and conversation to reply to an objection, to state the ground upon which an answer is made, therefore this being so. So it's suggesting there's some objection there, uh, or maybe it's implying that David knows that the Philistines are going to be doubtful of that, so he says, then you shall know what, very well, then you shall know what your servant can do. Uh, and as Bodder notes below, on the one hand, David's words can be construed as a pledge of allegiance to Ashish and his cause. But on the other hand, there is yet again a measure of equivocation in the language. Whether David is planning to destroy the Philistines from within their own camp cannot yet be determined. Uh, and then that you shall know what your servant can do will be echoed in verse 9. Uh, we can look at that now because it's no longer about them. It's here. Um, it's about what Saul has done, not um, what David can done. So Asha says to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life, and this is what I have over here, but I should have translated it more directly as, I will appoint you as the keeper of my head forever. Because we already saw later in chapter 29, the generals had said um, that David being with them will end up with them being decapitated, with their heads cut off. Uh, so uh, there's a little play here in 28.2 and what we'll see in 29. So with those two verses, we're done with the David and Philistine story. And then we get this repeat here from chapter 25, almost verbatim. Um, as Samora notes below, the present episode is out of place chronologically. And that's what I've been noting uh, all along here, that this is simultaneous. So I'm suggesting that this repetition of what we see in 25.1, let's look how similar it is. Samuel had died and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city, up to that far. And then we see in 25.1, Samuel died, all Israel assembled and mourned for him. They buried him in his home in Ramah. And then it goes to David. So this is simply a repetition. And chronologically, it's obviously happened earlier. But it's highlighting the fact for now that the dead Samuel is going to be the issue. And it's also highlighting a couple of other things. That the source that Saul has had for his intermediary relationship with Yahweh is gone. It also, by calling up um, the echo in chapter 25, reminds us of the Nabal story. Uh, and contrasting uh, Nabal the fool with Saul the fool here. So we're told that Saul had expelled the mediums and the wizards from the land. And this is one of those interpretive moments where more, more recent scholars, especially women scholars, have recognized how older scholars have made an enormous number of presuppositions about this. And I don't want to go through the whole history of scholarship because that would take a long time. But it's important that we can at least clear our heads from the false understandings. Um, one of those is that he's doing this in response to the language from uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy that I can put up here that makes that illegal. So we see here from Leviticus, do not turn to mediums or wizards, do not seek them out to be defiled by them, I am Yahweh your God. And in the next chapter, if any turn to mediums and wizards, prostituting themselves to them, I will set my face against them, etc. And then even more harshly from Deuteronomy, not using that same phrase, we, mediums and wizards, but clearly making the same point, 
when you come into the land that Yahweh your God is giving you, you must not learn to imitate the abhorrent practices of those nations. And just skipping to the important part here, anyone who practices divination, or is a soothsayer, or an augur, or a sorcerer, or one who casts spells, or consults ghosts or spirits, or who seeks oracles from the dead. For whoever does these things is abhorrent to Yahweh. Notice they're named as foreign practices, and it's the interpretation through Leviticus and Deuteronomy that this was a long a law against this, and the Deuteronomy attributes it to foreign practices that many scholars assume is the truth about our story. But there's absolutely no basis for assuming that whatsoever. Um, Deuteronomy, uh, as we know, the main part of it is from the 7th century, from the time of Josiah, and that will be important here. In fact, I can return to this here, and we see the final example of mediums and wizards um, in the Bible, which is at the very end, almost, of the Deuteronomistic history, is Josiah putting away the mediums, wizards, teraphims, and idols. So from the perspective of the Deuteronomistic history, starting with Deuteronomy and ending with 2 Kings, uh, this is certainly abhorrent. But 1 Samuel is not necessarily reflecting that ending argument. It may well be part of a different argument um, about monarchy, as we've been looking at in these chapters. And if you want to see more about that, I'd encourage you to go back to the introductory video for this unit on 1 Samuel 27 to 31. But as more recent scholars have said, reading the text on its own terms expresses no negativity about the woman of Endor at all. Um, if this is just Saul's act. And we know that just because Saul did something doesn't mean it has divine approval. Um, for example, we note the contrast that we looked at in our very last video, let's look at it here from 1 Samuel 30, where David decided to share, to make the spoils be shared among everybody, and the narrator said from that day forward, he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel. It continues to the present day. But we see nothing about that here, that Saul has made this uh, a statute. It is a statute in Leviticus, and it's referred to indirectly in Deuteronomy, but there's no sense that that's what Saul is doing here. Um, and the text doesn't suggest that it's illegal at all. It just says that he's done this. And having done it, he's going to call on them. So if anything, it's not expressing something foreign or there's something bad about this woman when we meet her or that she's a quote-unquote pagan, a word that's completely out of place in referring to the Hebrew Bible in any circumstances. It's a word from the Roman world referring to non-Romans. So its use for non-Christians is really an abhorrent use of imperial language to, uh, to denigrate other peoples. But we don't have to go there right now. Um, but in any event, um, this is just his act and one that he's probably regretting because he's going to have to disguise himself to not get in trouble with the very woman who he calls on who he had thought he had expelled. So there's a lot going on with that um, there. So one of the questions here is what do, what do these words actually mean? Hava oath va'et ha'yedoim here. Um, Obat is described either as a medium, a necromancer, uh, or whatever. Um, but when we look a little farther down, I think I've got it right here under medium, we see here is a list of just some of the titles that recent scholarship has tried to use, which being the more traditional one. And if you're looking for art, as I did, and I'll share some of that as we go, the Witch of Endor is the most common one. But that's completely foreign to this context. Uh, ghost Wife, Spirit Wife. Mistress of Ancestral Spirits, Mistress of Sorcery, Lady of the Ob Spirits, taking on the Hebrew directly, or Shaman. Um, and any of those are possible. But one thing that's clear is that she's practicing um, behaviors that are not foreign, um, that are local, as we'll see, and that plainly Saul expects to work, and they do work. Um, and there's nothing to suggest it's anti-Yahwistic. What I'd like to suggest is the reason for the uh, condemnation of these kinds of practices in Deuteronomy and Leviticus is part of the larger picture, both in the Deuteronomistic history and in the post-exilic text of Leviticus, to have worship centered in Jerusalem. Um, and Leviticus has two ways about it. It focuses it on rituals in, in the Jerusalem temple, but also on the text itself, recognizing that the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem meant you can't always have a temple, and subject to other empires, the temple might not be a place you can worship. So in the absence of a temple, you need a book, or at least a story, even if it's not written. But Deuteronomy is quite plain, Deuteronomy 16, the most clear place, where the only proper place to worship is the place where Yahweh will put his name, which is understood as Jerusalem. 
So whether it's Josiah's uh, condemnation of male priests who worship Yahweh and lead people to worship Yahweh on the so-called high places outside of Jerusalem, or here a woman who is engaging in a practice that plainly Israelites practiced, uh, it may be as much about non-Jerusalem centralized and controlled worship as it is about the specific kind of worship or the person who's doing it. She's simply not authorized. And as I was saying to my wife Sue, who is a spiritual director acting independently, it might be like someone in a more conservative Catholic church saying, why should we go listen to Sue? She's not a priest and the, and the church hasn't authorized her, even if she is trained and effective at what she's doing. So throughout the ages, we know that religious uh, authorities often abhor behavior that's simply something that's not under their control, especially in need of men's control and things like that. But we don't need to go too much there right now. So... Our story continues here with the, the Philistines assembling, and that's what makes Saul so nervous. So we get to these final places. Assembled and came and camped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. And you can see from Google Maps at least some sense of where these places are. Uh, I also showed them here, but we have to acknowledge that most of these places are guesses by scholars. We really don't know for sure. In this area somewhere, but we shouldn't take Google Maps at too literally, even though there is a kibbutz at Endor now, but it's named for the historical place. We don't know that it's actually the same as the historical place at all. <clears throat> so uh, Saul gathered all Israel and they're camped at Gilboa here. The first time we hear it here, it'll be the site of Saul's death uh, in chapter 31. Uh, when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. He's no longer afraid about David here. Now he's afraid of the Philistines. And it's a curious thing. This is the same term we heard in verse one. Um, He's been fighting the Philistines since the beginning. He was chosen to, to fight against the Philistines. Uh, he obviously picked David to fight against Goliath, but he's been fighting against the Philistines, sometimes successfully and sometimes less so. But why is he so afraid now that his heart trembled greatly, which is a very strong term here. We've heard it a few times earlier. I won't go back to all the places. But Saul is plainly at wit's end. And that's added to, his desperation is added to in verse 6 here. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, not by dreams or by Thurim or by prophets. Some scholars have taken this as somehow it's Saul's fault, that Saul's not listening. But the text is plainly not saying that. So when Saul inquired to say, he saw, as my note has below, um, the word meaning ass, so by a shal shaal. So when Saul saw, he got nothing. Um, we saw the Urim implicit of what David did in chapter 30, verse 7, um, or by prophets, and that'll be the dead Samuel. He has no new prophets, and he has no dreams, even though David hasn't had dreams either. So it certainly seems like it's Yahweh has withdrawn from him, and we heard earlier on that not only did he withdraw, he sent an evil spirit on Saul that led Saul to be throwing his spear at the wall and it, trying to pin David to the wall and all the paranoid stuff we saw earlier. Saul doesn't seem so paranoid now. He just seems terrified of the Philistines. And it's going to get worse after this chapter. So we'll go one more verse for today. And verse 7 here, and we hear the scholar Michael argues at length that the scene is a parody of the call story in, in chapter 9. He notes the parallel with Josiah in the opposite direction. And we'll be looking at that because a number of other scholars have noted the parallel between this woman of Endor who's a many scholars condemn, and Huldah, the woman who King Josiah um, uh, listens to, who's described as a prophet who's never condemned. And they're basically doing the same thing. So it's more based on the assumption of male scholars about the title than it is about anything the text actually says. And it's also about the character of Saul, who is plainly rejected here, and the character of Josiah, who's described as no king before or after Josiah was as great as him. So he's the ultimate hero of the Deuteronomistic history, not David, curiously. So, seek out for me, or literally, as Sumura says, search for me a woman who serves the Lady of the Ob Spirits, or the Mistress of Sorcery, and we're seeing those various titles there. Notice he's asking for a woman. Why is he asking for a woman in particular? And no scholar has an answer to that. There's nothing to think that, that medium is a woman's role and wizard is a male's role. Well, if you watch a lot of Harry Potter, maybe you'd want to go that way, or maybe it's Lord of the Rings. I don't know. I'm not so into the Lord of the Rings as maybe you are. Um, so if you know about that, you can put a note in the comments if you like. But he assumes a woman who is a medium. And notice he assumes you can find one, even though he's officially expelled them, so that I may go to her and ask of her, or seek of her. Here, it's not ask here, it's seek. So seek twice in the verse. 
um, he's going to seek of her. And his servant said to him, there's a medium at Endor. Notice, um, as Hamori notes, this may well be a humorous depiction of a court scene. His servants know just where to go. And notice they don't object at all. They don't say, wait a minute, didn't you expel the mediums and the wizards? Um, or that's illegal. Where would he find one? We would certainly wouldn't know where one was. But they know immediately where one is. And there's, notice the narrator doesn't say anything here. There's no sense of any objection to this. There's a medium at Endor. And Sumora notes, perhaps overstating it, modern Kerbet as Safa Safa, um, northeast of Shunem, where the Philistines were in camp, but actually um, scholars have suggested they really don't know, although Miller suggests it, this location would be chosen for its nearness, nearness to Mount Tabor, a worship place. Um, uh, Susie Park, a Korean-American scholar who offers an interesting insight from her mother's experience of being raised in a conservative Korean Presbyterian church, but also continuing to practice things like astrology, will note that what's going on here in terms of Israelites um, going to a medium is not that different than her conservative Christian mother listening to astrology. The question here is the meaning of the term Endor, and En is just a contraction of Ein, um, for Ayan, for I, or spring, and it can mean either dwelling or or it can mean generations. So she suggests um, down here after my note about it, familiar with her father, that it could mean the spring and dwelling place of the generations, which is to say a place of ancestor gathering, if not ancestor worship. There's no sense that Samuel is going to be worshipped in this scene, and there's no sense that she's calling people up so people can worship them. Uh, it's simply a perhaps a place understood as associated with the ancestors. So having heard, being told there is such a woman, Saul will take off his royal robes, and no longer being a king, of course, and go see if this woman can help him. And we'll see what happens there next time. See you then. Bye-bye.